In this segment, we're going to take a look at Cold War containment policies and how the United States responded to the threat of communist expansion. As we look at the origins of the Cold War, we need to understand that the Cold War is going to set the framework for global politics for the 45 years after the end of World War II. It's going to influence our domestic policies and the way we conduct foreign affairs and how much of a role the United States government should play in the economy. The Cold War was essentially a competition between two very different ways of organizing the government, society, and the economy. The American-led Western nation's belief in democracy and individual freedom and the market economy versus the Soviet belief in a totalitarian state and socialism. As I mentioned, the Cold War lasted from the end of World War II, 1945, until the Soviet Union collapsed in 1989. The United States and the Soviet Union represented starkly different fundamental values. The United States, again, a democratic political institution, generally a free market economic system. And the totalitarian Soviet Union had a communist or a strongly socialist economic system. The Truman Doctrine, that is, the idea of containment of communism, was going to become the guiding principle of American foreign policy throughout the Cold War. Not to roll it back, mind you, but to keep it from spreading, to resist communist aggression in other countries so that it does not infringe on our allies and then ultimately on ourselves. Let's take a little refresher look at the Cold War themes. The idea of containment to stop the spread of communism. The domino theory, the idea that if one nation falls to communism, its neighbors would fall. Collective security, the idea of a defensive alliance system, that an attack on one will be an attack on all. Massive retaliation, using the threat of complete war to deter an attack. An arms race, the rapid buildup of weapons to prevent an attack, showing that you're stronger than your enemy. And brinkmanship, that is living on a near state of war so that each side will take great care not to upset the balance. We've talked about Europe becoming divided, but the world also formed into two divided camps. On one side, we have NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. This was formed as a defensive alliance among the United States and the Western European countries to prevent Soviet expansion, to prevent their invasion of Western Europe after World War II. Again, if any one nation would, would be attacked, it would be considered an attack on all. The blue nations on this map represent NATO. The Soviet Union didn't wait long to respond. They created what's called the Warsaw Pact. That was the Soviet Union and its allies in Eastern Europe, and they lasted for nearly 50 years. Both sides maintained very large military forces that faced off against each other across the Iron Curtain. The defensive alliance system for the Soviet Union provided a buffer zone in case the Western nations attacked, which they desperately were afraid of. And it produced, again, two very large armed camps in the war, and all it would take would be a simple spark, like the one that led into World War I, but a simple spark could throw the United States and the rest of the world into World War III. Most people believed that spark was going to happen in Berlin. After the Soviet Union matched the United States in nuclear weaponry in the 1950s, the threat of nuclear war that would destroy both countries was ever-present throughout the Cold War. America, under President Eisenhower, adopted a policy of massive retaliation to deter any nuclear strike by the Soviets. What of the hot spots that we really needed to pay attention to during the Cold War was China. China was taken over by the communists shortly after World War II. And the increased American fears of a communist domination of most of the rest of the world was now very real. China was the largest and most populated nation in Asia and had been a strong ally of the United States. But this guy, Mao Zedong, led a communist revolution in 1949. And this was described by America as a terrible loss for us. After all, if they're communists, they're no longer a valued trade partner. They're no longer a military partner in Asia. 
But rather than being strong allies with the Soviet Union, the communist nations of China and the Soviet Union started to split and they eventually became rivals where the Soviet Union would try to exert its influence on China and China would push back and say, no, thank you, we have our own way. This worked out very well for the United States. This split was encouraged by President Richard Nixon in the 1970s, actually visited China to ease our relations with China and then, of course, put extra pressure on the evil Soviet Union. However, in spite of us encouraging this split, China was communist. Today, when we look at China, we see that it continues to oppress free thought and democracy. China put down a pro-democracy march in Tiananmen Square in 1989, where we thought things were getting better in China, and it turns out that they simply got much worse. Communism currently is fading, and, and fading kind of rapidly. The United States increases its role at, in China as we increase our trade. China is now a, a favored nation when it comes to American trade, and the influx of the American dollars is, 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 is chipping away at some of the old communist ideas, and many elements of capitalism are coming up in China today. Another hot spot that we must address is Korea. We're actually going to come, come and fight a hot war in Korea. After World War II, Korea was divided along the 38th parallel, a, a north and a south. The North Koreans were communist. They share a border with China. The South Koreans are, are democratic. They, they tend to support the United States and the Western allies. And American involvement in the Korean War in the early 1950s is going to represent our policy of containment, that is to say, to stop the spread of communism. Here's how it worked. The Korean War began when communist North Korea invaded South Korea in 1950. And as you can see by this map, the North Koreans pushed deep into the South by September of 1950. At that moment, the United Nations realized that we needed to step in and do something. After the communists invaded North Korea, the American military forces led a counterattack that was also included other United Nations nations and a counterattack that drove deep into North Korea, and as you can see by where the green represents that, that represents our counterattack. We pressed them way back. By November of 1950, the United States and the, United Na the UN forces are on the border of China and poised, ready to move in. However, in, uh, uh, shortly after that, the Chinese forces joined in the fight. The Chinese backed North Korea and pressed backward and threatened to widen it. And eventually, we stopped that counterattack at the original line of the 38th parallel. A stalemate was drawn. Now, notice the dates along the bottom, 1950, 1950, 1950. Most of the fighting took place as far as changing hands. However, between 1951 and 1953, for two years, the United States-led forces fought the Chinese and North Korean forces at the cost of over 50,000 American lives. The Korean War, it was certainly a move of containment. Eventually, an armistice was drawn, and that boundary line stayed. If we take a look at Korea today, it is still divided along the 38th parallel with a communist north and a pro-western south. The armistice agreement is still in, in effect. It has held up. Uh, though Americans are, are still stationed there, we are not necessarily poised on the front line ready to attack. Sporadically, every couple of years, shots may be fired back and forth across the border, but for the most part, the armistice has stayed solid. 
More recently, North Korea has threatened world peace by building and testing nuclear weapons. Uh, and this nuclear proliferation is going to threaten world peace as they are very close to China, which is a possible attack site, very close to Japan, and also to South Korea. And remember that the United States is still engaged in a protectorate role over Japan, that an attack on Japan would be considered an attack on the United States. Another hot spot happened in Cuba. Yes, Cuba that had been a, a, a first a Spanish colony. The United States went to war against Spain and liberated Cuba, and Cuba became a protectorate, is now going to be a serious problem for us and another site of Cold War confrontation. In the late 1950s, this guy, Fidel Castro, led a communist revolution that took over Cuba. Many Cubans fled, many who were loyal to the old government, many Cubans who, who had befriended the United States, many Cubans who opposed communism uh, fled. They ran away and set up residence in the United States, especially in Florida. Many of these exiles, as they were called, especially the men of fighting age, were taken in by the CIA. And the idea in the 1960s was to give them weapons, train them, and let them attack Cuba and reclaim Cuba for a free and peace-loving democracy. They led their invasion at a place called the Bay of Pigs. Regrettably, every single last one of them was either killed or captured. A remarkable victory for Fidel Castro. After all, the great United States was behind this. The president at the time, John F. Kennedy, had to come on national TV and apologize publicly for, for this boggled invasion at the Bay of Pigs. And that's when things got kicked up a notch. After 1962, Fidel Castro called up Nikita Khrushchev in the Soviet Union and asked for a little more help. Khrushchev insisted that Castro allow the Soviet Union to place missiles in Cuba that could be pointed at the United States. The United States, through espionage, uh, that is to say we spied on them, took pictures, found out what the, the Soviets were doing, and we called them on it in October of 1962. It's what's called the Cuban Missile Crisis. It lasted 14 days, and so for two weeks, the world was on the brink of global nuclear annihilation. President Kennedy demanded that the Soviets remove their missiles, and quite literally, every day here for two weeks, we were on the brink of war. Eventually, the Soviet Union conceded. Eventually, they agreed to pull out their missiles in exchange for a promise, a promise that the United States would never invade Cuba. Well, we made the promise. The Soviets took their missiles out. Apparently, there was a side deal that went on as well, where the United States was going to remove some of its missiles in Turkey, which is a nation immediately south of the Soviet Union. Though that was never publicly linked to the Cuban Missile Crisis, it does seem, especially at the time, that John F. Kennedy got the best of the evil Soviet Union. And as, as his Secretary of, of State put it, the Soviet Union and their leadership has blinked, and they removed their missiles. Peace was secured, but tensions remained. Today, as we look at Cuba, they are still a communist nation. Cuba continues to violate human rights and the basic freedoms of its people. Shortly after the Cuban Missile Crisis, the United States engaged in a, an embargo, that is a, a refusal to trade anything with Cuba, and also a, a refusal to travel into, into Cuba. And this was a, a retaliation to, to their communist system. The idea in the 1960s was we would cripple them by refusing to trade. We felt that as soon as the Soviet Union collapsed, their only big trade partner, then communism would collapse. Well, that was in 1989. 
and they're still communists. Then perhaps we felt that with the end of Fidel Castro, who stepped aside uh, recently, that might mean the, the ending of Cuban communism, but maybe not. While the relations have thawed a little bit, it is only speculation. Will the end of Castro mean normal relations with Cuba? Well, many Cuban Americans today continue to actively support the embargo, to support the sanctions against the communist regime that's there. And, and they insist that only when the Castros are gone and communism is gone, that's when the United States should join hands with Cuba again. We see that the policies of the Cold War and containment completely dominated foreign and domestic policy for the second half of the 20th century. And that's going to set the stage for a new world at the end of the Cold War.